Psalm 31, a refuge in chaotic times. This is to the choir master, a psalm of David. So I want you to think about this as I read and preach. This was a psalm to be sung. Now, a lot of times we think of our singing as that which is happy and uh, always upbeat. Here's a refutation of that thinking. Some of our singing is happy. Some of our singing is upbeat. Songs are also given to be sung in lament and uh, congregationally as well. So here's an example of that, a song of grief. Yes, there are strains of joy, but there's much grief and heartache in this particular psalm. The psalmist says, In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me. A strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead and guide me. You take me out of the net they have hidden for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction and have known the distress of my soul. And you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set me, my feet, in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief. My soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I've become a reproach, especially to my neighbors and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I've been forgotten like one who is dead. I've become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. We'll stop there for now. Lord, we thank you for the word of God. And Lord, no doubt all of us can identify at some level with this, this psalm. We have faced troubles that have come to us unexpectedly, uninvited, due to no specific uh, action of our own. We have found ourselves in trying times though we know everything that is wrong with this world as a result of sin though there may not be something particular that has brought about the circumstances that we may find ourselves in now in fact we we all feel the effects of sin at large sin among the larger community among the nation and the world. And those are, there are times, O oh Lord, so many of them in which trouble is ours because we have invited it, because we have not taken seriously the pursuit of holiness, and we are feeling your hand of chastisement upon us. Afflictions are part and parcel of this life, as you know, our Lord, and we, your servants, are weak of mind and weak of body and frail and insufficient in ourselves. And like the psalmist, we grow weary from moaning. And we need to hear just the word refuge. And to know that you are the refuge for your hurting and troubled people living in a time of chaos. So Lord, would you give speech to the preacher, 
clarity to my mind, unction of the spirit, passion of the heart, and would you use the preaching of your word to minister to your people, whether that is to rebuke, to exhort, to encourage, whether it's to break a bone and then fix the bone, to wash us in the word of God. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the psalmist says here, he declares, and this is, again, a song to be sung. He says, In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. And then in verse 2, he says, Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge. And so on the one hand, he says, you are my refuge. On the other hand, he says, be my refuge. And so he goes from his faith to his experience. God, you are my refuge. I know that. I believe that. I trust that. But I'm not feeling that right now. Be my rock of refuge. Let me experience the reality of, that you are my refuge, a strong fortress to save me. And that's what he says in verse 3, for you are my rock and fortress. <laughs> verse 2, be a rock. Verse 3, you are my rock. You are my fortress. And for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Show me the way, Lord. Let me understand the way and then guide me in that way. And then he says, you take me out of the net they've hidden for me, for you are my refuge. So here's his statement, his bold and confident declaration of faith. In you, I take refuge. He has no one else. Whom in heaven do I have but you? He's looked in other places and found no refuge that is indeed a safe place a place of protection, a place of peace, a place of confidence in the midst of the storm. And David is often pursued, pursued by Saul, pursued by others. The armies are raised up against him, but I take refuge in God. God is my safe place, my strong place, my satisfying place, my sweet place. He's my God. But be my rock of refuge. You are my rock. Be my rock. Of refuge. I trust you as my refuge, yet be my refuge. It's all appropriate. It's, the, it's our Christian experience, isn't it? We know who God is, and yet we need God's help to live out the knowledge of who God is in our experience. He's my rock, be my rock. He's my refuge, be my refuge. I know you are, Lord, but the armies have raised up against me. They seek my life. Even my close companions, he says here in verse 31, I've become an a reproach to them. The dread of my acquaintances, he says. Those who once have had sweet fellowship with me, David is saying, now don't even want to see me, or they're whispering about me. They're scheming, at worst, scheming against me, plotting to take my life. God is our refuge in chaos. Now, I don't know what you have brought into this room this morning. I don't know what is weighing heavy upon your shoulders. I don't know what is squeezing and pressing at your heart. I don't know what fears you're particularly struggling with right now. Individual fears and struggles and sins that you're facing. Family issues. Issues at the workplace. Maybe you are among the many who are indeed fearful about the direction of our nation. And so you declare with the psalmist, you are my refuge, be my refuge. You are my rock be my rock. David is not a double-minded man. Spurgeon says, we ask God that we may enjoy and experience what we grasp by faith. I know this is true. Make my knowledge experiential. And so we, we don't always experience, do we? Do you? <laughs> 
do you always experience what you know to be true? You know it's true. In the depth of your being, you know it's true. But sometimes, like David, you say, Oh, Lord, where are you? How long, oh, Lord? How long? And you cry out, and the way seems dark, and you wonder where God is even as you pray to God. So our experience seems to argue against our faith. Our practice seems to rise up and, and debate whether we have any faith or not from time to time. But we know that it's true. And so we ask God to be what He is, to display what He is in our experience. That we might know in the midst of the storm and the chaos and the fearful troubles that we face that God indeed is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in trouble. And for an example, an example we see here in verse 5, David's words, into thy hands I commit my spirit you know this is how we one way we know that jesus prayed the psalms right so he hung from the cross he looked to the father who had forsaken him as the curse of sin was placed upon him and jesus cried out my god my god why hast thou forsaken me to that same god jesus says to you O father i commit my spirit and so on the lips of the living David, he prays to God, he commits to God his spirit, because the spirit is that which is safe even when the body fails. For the Christian, even when our body breaks down and we breathe our last sigh of life and we enter into eternity, the body they may kill, the body it will die, but the soul is untouched. It is in the safe keeping of our faithful God, our refuge, and our strength. And so this is a commitment we can make as we live, and this is a declaration of faith we can make as we die. Let it be. Pray to God that he might give you the faith on your deathbed to say, into your hands, O Lord, I commit my spirit. Because later he says, my life is in your hands. He lives that way. He dies that way. That's what we want as well. That's what we want as well. I am yours. You purchased me, O oh, faithful God. You are my rock, my fortress. I commit my spirit to you because you have redeemed me, O oh, faithful God. And so in the midst of trouble and tragedy, this commitment is made. You are my refuge. Be my refuge. I commit my spirit to you later. My, hand, my time is in your hands. But in his trouble, what does he need? Sometimes when I'm reading the Psalms, as I do every morning, um, I, I use all kinds of things, note cards, and I'm making notes. And, and lately I've been saying, Lord, as I read this Psalm, this is what I want from you. This is what I ask of you based on this Psalm that I've read. And so I, I simply write down my request from God, for God, based on the psalm. And the psalmist says here, because you have redeemed me, I commit my spirit to you. My rock, my fortress, my refuge, be my rock, my fortress, and my refuge. He makes this commitment in time of trouble. Look, at verse, look down to verse 9. He says, I'm in distress. My eye is wasted from grief. You can often know when a person is going through suffering and trial, by looking into their eyes. The eyes indeed reveal so often, don't they? The health, emotional health, physical health of an individual. You can tell by looking in their eyes, something's not right. Maybe they're physically ill. Maybe they're emotionally drained. Their, their eyes are not vibrant. Maybe they're sunken in. Maybe they're distressed. Maybe they're red. And the psalmist says, my eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. That's another way you know when someone's often in distress, right? There's, there's sighs. They sigh. And you can hear it if you're close to them and you know them. They're sighing because they're trying it often to... To, get, to grab the, the strength that they need to take the next difficult step in the trial that they're facing. My life is spent with sorrow, my years with sorrow, my strength fails because of my iniquity, and my bones waste away. 
our troubles are here because sometimes our, indeed, it's because of our specific and personal sins. But not every trial we face is a result. We know if we were to look at all of Scripture as a result of some personal sin, the boy was born blind, not because of a particular sin of his or his family's, but that the power of God might be displayed. But all trouble that is here is a result of sin. We live in a fallen world. We have sinned. We've come short of the glory of God. Everything is fallen. Everything is grieving. The, the, the grass right now is crying out, Oh, Lord, give me drink. Give me water. The earth is groaning. It's quaking. It's earthquaking. Hurricanes are pounding. Tornadoes are ripping homes and landscape apart. Fires are burning, even in Georgia. Not just out west, but now in Georgia. We live in a fallen world, and as a result, suffering and heartbreak is our experience. It is the air we breathe. It is the ground we walk upon. It's our heart's cry. But as Christians, we can't check out. We can't lose hope. We can't give up. We can't wring our our hands in despair. We, We have to look to God and say, Lord, you are my refuge. I need to see that, to feel that, to taste that, to know that now be my refuge. I'm wasting away. I'm languishing in grief. My eyes are sunken to the back of my head. I'm gasping for survival. Help me, O Lord. And sometimes that's all we can pray. Psalm 6, the psalm of the day. I mean, it begins like, I have mercy on me, Lord. Be gracious to me. I am languishing. I'm your child. I'm languishing here. Help me. Have mercy. Will God not help his languishing, hurting, broken children? He's got a, he's, he's a reproach to enemies and to former friends. He's like a broken vessel. When he's succeeding, everybody wants to be with him. When he's failing, not so much. And that's just life, right? I mean, if you guys sort of, you know, hit the jackpot and you start to become successful, you'll find you've got a lot of extra friends you didn't know you had before. And then when things turn south, guess what? Where, where are all those friends? <laughs> Who's going to be with you when you die? That's, a, that's the sort of lifelong loyal friend. They'll be there th- through the dangers, toils, and snares. They'll be there when you die. And so David knew the, the suffering of that. He hears the whispering. He knows the terror, he says. But verse 14, he's trusting in the Lord. He knows that his time, his life, his circumstances, everything about him is in the hands of God. And he prays that God would rescue him from his enemies, from his persecutors, that he would bless him by making his face to shine upon him, that the Lord would protect him from shame, from abandoning the faith, disgracing Christ's name, disgracing Christ's cause in the midst of suffering. One of the great temptations is in the heart of, in the heat of battle, to choose a sinful pathway for relief. To find another way around the valley of the shadow of death that has been ordained that we walk through. And then verse 19, he's declaring the goodness of God. In verse 21, he's blessing the Lord. The Lord has blessed him, he blesses God. Verse 22, we get more of a sense of his heart. He said, I've set in my alarm, I'm cut off from your sight. I mean, he felt that way at times. I'm cut off. Many godly people throughout history have had seasons in which they doubted the very reality of their salvation. They've looked at their lives and say, and they've heard the the voice whisper in their ears, how can I be a child of God if I've just thought that thought and if I just committed this deed and if life is so dark? How can I be one that has heard the call of God to rejoice in the Lord always when my soul is so down? cast how can I be I set in my alarm I'm cut off from your sight but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried for help and then he calls on the congregation love the Lord all you his saints 
He preserves the faithful, repays those who act in pride. Be strong and take courage, all you who wait on the Lord. And so he's in trouble. He's in distress. He remembers former days of God's deliverance. He trusts God for the future. He describes his hurts and his struggles and his difficulties throughout. He prays that God would be dis- gracious because presently he's in distress. Been in trouble in times past. God helped him. That's the way to sure up your faith in the present. To remember how God helped you in the past. To remember how God delivered you from a very difficult season, difficult time in your life. How God answered prayer, came to your aid, ministered to your need, brought you through. Right now in the midst of the battle, you don't see any way I can never get, you say, I can't get through this. And so when you have those thoughts, you've got to remember, you've got to reflect, you've got to look back to your own personal experience, but also to biblical history and see the faithfulness of God throughout biblical history and all of history. And remember that all history is his story, right? It's a story of God's great providence. He commits his spirit to God. He, God is his refuge. So what does he do? What does that mean? I commit my life to you. I commit my spirit to you. The words Jesus drew from the Psalms and from the cross. God had delivered his son many times. We've read about that in John. It wasn't time yet for him to go to the cross. And so they couldn't make him a king. They couldn't lay hands on him. They tried to arrest him. They couldn't. Nobody ever spoke like this. Can't arrest a guy like that. So they tried. They schemed. They plotted. But no one could touch Jesus until it was time. He would not die until it was time. He would not go to the cross until it was time. And when he got there, he knew it was time. And he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. So the enemies have been frustrated numerous times, but the the cross displays the final battle. And the night before the cross as Jesus in Gethsemane cries out with sweat drops of blood, my God, if it's possible for this cup, this cup of your judgment, this cup of your wrath, let it pass from me, but not as I will, but as you will. And so Jesus faced that final battle. It was a dark battle. He went to the cross for the joy that was before him, beyond the cross, despising the shame. Forsaken by the Father, he commits to the Father, and God delivers him yet again. But this time he delivers him by resurrection and ascension and exaltation and gives him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and tongue confess that he is Lord. And Christians pray that still, don't we? Have you prayed that in tough times? Lord, I commit my spirit to you. My body's failing. Maybe some of you have been delivered from uh, deadly disease. You've seen the hand of God deliver you through that, and you've come on the other side, and you're thankful, but at the time it seemed as if, you know, my body's it's not going to make it this time. And to you I commit my spirit. Or just the, the, the hardships of life that... that always affect us more than emotionally it it does wear on a person's body and their ability to think clearly sometimes their ability to see clearly their ability to breathe clearly the physical effects of suffering is seen throughout the psalm you know it's true and you just say lord to you i commit my spirit as i live i commit my spirit to you as i die james montgomery boyce who died rather uh, suddenly after a pretty brief bout with cancer as a relatively young man about, I guess about 10 years ago now, maybe a little bit longer, pastor of 10th Presbyterian in Philadelphia. He said the saints ask God to be to them in death what they've known him to be in life. And these were the last words. Into your hand I commit my spirit of St. Bernard, of John Huss, of Jerome, of Martin Luther, and many others. Luther himself 
prayed or said, Blessed are those who die not only for the Lord as martyrs, not only in the Lord as believers, but likewise with the Lord as breathing forth their last words as these, into thy hands I commit my spirit. We die, some people, some of us may die as martyrs. Prayerfully, all of us in this room will die as believers, but we can die as the Lord died, with the Lord, if we say by faith, into thy hands, I commit my spirit. Boyce tells of John Huss, condemned to be burned at the stake. The bishop who conducted the ceremony said, and now we commit thy soul to the devil. John Huss calmly replied, I commit my spirit into the hands, into thy hands, Lord Jesus Christ. Unto thee I commend my spirit, which thou hast redeemed. And so David has been endangered and delivered. He's in danger again. He prays for help. God is my refuge. He's my safe place. He's the place I can flee like the cities of refuge in the Old Testament. Of people who are not intently killed. They were able to flee from the wrath of a death that they had been connected to. The wrath of a family member that might come after them or others. To these cities of refuge. And there no one could touch them. No one could take them. No one could imprison them. Vengeance could not be executed on them in the cities of refuge. And for Christians, Christ is our refuge. And though, as Luther said, though the body they may kill, thy truth abideth still. And that truth is this, when our spirit is committed to the Lord, no one can touch it. No one can take it. God is our refuge. God is our refuge. He's our strong rock. As one commentator put it from the years in which David was fleeing King Saul and found safety in the high rocks of the Judean wilderness, so God was his rock of refuge. God saw his affliction. He's not blind to your affliction. God saw it, David says. God saw his affliction. He knows his little sheeps tossing and turning. He keeps your tears in his bottle. He is not asleep at the will. He's not up there, you know, sort of mocking you as you toss and turn and cry and weep and struggle and are heavy laden. He sees your affliction. He saw David's affliction. He knew his anguish. He got it. He engaged in it. He was not detached. He didn't deliver him to the hand of the enemy, but he supplied his needs. Now, as, as we wrap this up, I'm going to give you several bullet points, a number of quick bullet points of application to help you think through God as my refuge and my strength. I'm not going to go back and read the verses. I may just give you the verse you can jot down for later. But first one is this. God will not desert his people. Verse 1, God will not desert his people. Faith knows that. Faith knows that. I've been uh, clinging to a Bible verse that Lori gave me a few weeks ago that uh, is in, in the truck. And it's, uh, it's simply the essence of, you know, God goes before you. God is with you. God will not leave you. And so I just repeat that over and over to myself. God goes before me. God is with me. God will not leave me. He will not desert his people. He's promised that with a double negative. You can't do that, right, in English. <laughs> if, we, if we took the Hebrews passage, I will not leave you, I will not forsake you, in, in, in Greek it's I will not, I will not leave you, I will not, I will not, I will not forsake you. <laughs> I will never, never leave you, I will never, never, never forsake you. God will not desert his people. You know that by faith. Cling to what you know when it doesn't feel like it. And secondly, know this, God bows down and hears, verse 2. That's the way the King James puts that one. He bows down his ear and hears. This is our engaged God. This is our exalted God, high and lifted up. His glory fills heaven's throne and temple. And 
He's glorious beyond comparing. Yet the Bible says he hears. He, he bows his ear to hear his children. Don't you love all these little ones sitting around us? And except for me, most of them are shorter than you. You know, uh, they're, all about, they're all about my height. But... And when a child speaks to you, how often do you, you bow down? Or sometimes you, you get down on your knees. You get at their level and, and you listen. Yes, you're bigger. Yes, you're stronger. Yes, you're smarter. Maybe. <laughs> but when the, the, a little child calls out for you, you get down and you look them in the eye and you, you listen to them. And sometimes you take them in your arms. You hold them close. And you try to interpret what they're saying. And when they're really little, they speak an unknown tongue. And then, being at our church, we work the charismania out of them, and you, <laughs> we make them good, quiet Baptists <laughs> who sit in their pew. God bows down and hears. He hears His saints. As Spurgeon says, the Lord has an hourly regard to the weakest moanings of His poorest children. He hears. Thirdly, the arrival of the avowal of our reliance upon God in times of adversity is a principled method of glorifying Him. And I take that point, uh, quoting Spurgeon directly. The avowal of our reliance upon God in times of adversity is a principled method of glorifying Him. And so when you're struggling, preach to yourself, speak to yourself, talk to yourself, and say, the Lord is my refuge. The Lord is goes before me, the Lord will not leave me, the Lord will be with me. Just say that to yourself. Preach the truth to yourself. Next, there are nets that are set for you out there. There are dangers, tools, and snares. You need to be Ephesians 6, Christian, putting on the armor of God so that you may stand against the evil schemings of the wicked one. And sometimes believers get entangled in the net. Their thinking becomes confused. Everything is dark, difficult, gloom, despair. Their thinking is sinful. Their attitudes are wrong. Their nets, are, they get ensnared in the net. But, but they only must look once to Christ. He is a delivering God. Know that the nets are there. When troubles come, temptations will come with them. Look to the Lord. Fifth, commit your spirit into the hands of God. Verse 5. As one has said, these living words of David were our Lord's dying words. Make them your living and your dying words. Six, learn to hate sin and evil doers. Verse 6. Learn to hate sin and evil doers. He says, I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. Yes, Christians love their enemies. And their enemies, enemies of Christ, enemies of His church, they, they, uh, we love them. They they spew evil. They do evil. They they walk in sin. We're reminded of you know apart from God's grace, there I we remember the gospel for ourselves. We love them through the lens of the gospel, and yet there's a sense in which Christians. It's like a hatred towards them as well. It's a love-hate relationship. Not, not hatred, hatred out of vindictiveness. Not a stewing anger that eats us alive as we breathe. But there's a hatred for the sinner who opposes God. That's why I said that this is not an election for banners and yard signs. And ballroom dancing and cheers. Because there's, sin, there's those who delight in sin, who pay regard to that which is worthless, who oppose morality and righteousness often. Let us learn to hate sin. And, and so when we come to a choice like we do on, on Tuesday, we, we are aligning ourselves with something bigger than a candidate when we vote. We're thinking about 
that which is reflective of morality, that which is reflective of righteousness, though the candidate themselves may not reflect that of Republican, Democrat, third party, independent, whatever. We, we want to hate sin, not champion sin. And I think there, it takes wisdom to navigate through this life as, as sin is all around us. How do we navigate through a sinful world and, and be faithful to Christ, be good citizens of heaven, good citizens of the earth, make decisions at the, the ballot box that doesn't champion sin and yet is wise and results in humility and prayer? I don't have all the answers to that. I mean, I've been struggling with this from day one. Our family has. Our, I, told our, I, I gave a lesson to our children this morning, and I said, you know, those who can vote, and I, I said, you know, pray. Same thing I told you, read the Scripture, seek the mind of Christ, and go vote your conscience. And so, you know, we may be, you know, just casting each other's, you know, voting against each other, <laughs> and we love each other. But we don't love sin and we don't love evil. That's why our heart is broken. But we're thinking through the arguments and thinking through how to best hold up a philosophy that embraces morality and righteousness. But you see the struggle, the anguish, the difficulty even in communicating through this. But we have to learn to hate sin. And we see suffering and trouble in our world. And we see the result of that what's behind that is sin, but beyond the fact that that has brought suffering into our world, it's an offense to a God who's holy, kind, generous, and the psalmist says good. And so we want to learn to hate, not keep sin close in our hearts. Seventh, and let me move quickly, we must rejoice in God's mercy, though the way be hard, verse 7. We must rejoice in God's mercy, though the way be hard. Spurgeon said, Jesus dives into the lowliest depths with us, comprehending the direst of our woes because he has felt the same. How do we do it? Well, we look to Jesus, who was rejected by his own, just as David was. Who was mocked, schemed against, abused, just as David was. Whose enemies rose up against him, just as David's situation was who felt the, the sting of emotional suffering and loss and pain and the physical brutality of the cross and he pioneered the way of salvation. And so we remember when we suffer that Jesus will dive to the lowest depths with us. He will comprehend the direst of our woes because he's been there first and he's our great and sympathetic high priest as Hebrews chapter 4 says. That's who he is. That's who he is. Next. We must remember, remember that in our struggles, our souls may grow stronger through the great challenges of life. Soon all the leaves will be gone from our non-evergreen trees, right? And winter will come. But there could be no spring leafing and spring fruit if winter didn't come first. It takes the cold air, it takes the winter months to prepare the trees to leaf again, to prepare the fruit to grow again, so that then we can go the spring and the summer and take the apple and take the peaches and enjoy because they've been through the struggle of the winter and have come back stronger. Next. What we need is mercy, verse 9. Soul and body are interconnected. It affects us, our suffering does. We need God's mercy. God, don't give me what I deserve here. Please, would you bring some relief in this situation? Be merciful to me, Lord. I'm your child. I'm hurting. If my sweet little girl was suffering, I would go to her aid. And you love me more than I love her. Tenth, life may be spent in sorrow, and yet one can serve God devotedly in the midst of that. Learn how to marshal trials for the glory of God and for your good and for the good of others. Verse 14, he says, I trust in the Lord. Eleven, your times, our times, 
Grace Community Church's times, the United States of America's time, it's in God's hands. Verse 15. It's in, it's in God's hands. He says, my times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. So when you say that this is all in God's hands, sometimes Christians say that as a means of just sort of checking out on life. God's not interested in anything down here. You know, don't polish brass on a sinking ship. You know, don't do anything to make life better here because God's in control. It's all in his God's hands. He doesn't need me. There's nothing for me to do. Well, that's not biblical. That's not biblical. Yes, it's in God's hand, but you see the activity of David here, how he's praying, how he's pursuing holiness, how he's asking God to defeat his enemies, and, and you know how God's going to do that? Through David's armies, right? From David's knees, actively pursuing God. So it's not exactly right for us to say, you know, we don't want to bring politics, for example, into the pulpit, because God is sovereign over all things. God is king over everything. And so we look to God for wisdom and answers, right? And we try to engage ourselves as best we can in a fallen world and a fallen body with fallen emotions, fallen mental capacities. Our times are in his hands. As one old writer put it, we are steered by infinite wisdom towards our desired haven. Providence is a soft pillow to anxious heads. You need a soft pillow? I was talking to a former college football player this week, and he was telling me about life as a football player back in the, uh, I think he was late 60s, early 70s time frame. And you know, he said, you know, uh, every night before a game, the coaches would come by and hand us a sleeping pill because <laughs> they wanted their players to sleep. <laughs> and so sleeping pill, they, they knew the importance of sleep. And so before every football game, you get a sleeping pill. And he told me some other interesting stories about football. So that's another day. So God is our sleeping aid. <laughs> the soft pillow of knowing that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who are the called according to his purpose. It's a soft pillow that we can lay our heads upon and rest with confidence. Next, verse 16, we need God's blessing. Quoting Spurgeon again, he says, Give me the sunshine of heaven in my soul, and I will defy the tempest of earth. God bless me, and I will fight. I will fight. I need your blessing and your help. Next, verse 19, Recall the goodness of God, as we've already mentioned, in times of difficulty. Remember how God has been so good to you in the past, and count your many blessings now. Name them one by one. And you will be astonished, right, at what God has done and what God is doing and what you have and what you're blessed with. Verse 21, return the blessing back to God. Then take that and bless God for it. Recount past blessings. Think of present blessings. And let no mercy go unsung. Sing the mighty power and goodness of God. Verse 22, confess your sins to God. I mean... Hardship is a good time to examine ourselves, right? We should always be confessing. Christians should be known as repenters. Always confessing, but confess your sins to the Lord. Then, verse 23, love the Lord. You know, so we love the Lord by trusting Him. We love the Lord by seeing Him as our refuge. We love the Lord by not, we love the Lord by not slandering Him, by not cursing Him, by not hearing Job's wife, he says, curse God and die. We love the Lord by thinking what's true and right about it. That's the same way we love one another. So we come to the Lord's table in a moment. We love one another by thinking rightly about each other, by thinking the best of one another, by praying for one another. Love the Lord. And then finally, be courageous. That's how he ends this. Be strong. And let your heart take courage, all you who wait on the Lord. Now, how can I do that? You know, as in the Old Testament saints about to go into battle, about to go take the land, you know, go do this, but remember, I'm with you. I'm with you. How can we be strong and take courage when things are falling apart all around us? We, we wait on the Lord. We trust Him. We wait patiently. We love Him. We bless Him. We 
plead for him to him for mercy. We recognize, verse 19, again, his goodness, his presence, how he's hid us beneath the shadow of fruit of the apple tree. We say he is our God. We ask for his help. We recognize his enemies. We seek his grace. We turn from our sin. We declare he's our rock. We say to God, you're my refuge. We say to God, be my refuge. And then we can play the man. We can stand up and we can stand strong and we can be faithful even when the bottom has dropped out. Even when your candidate doesn't get elected. Even when your dreams are not fulfilled. I know you've heard before that God will fulfill all your dreams. <laughs> Sometimes he won't. <laughs> and you should thank God for that. <laughs> Father, thank you for being our refuge and our strength. A very present help in time of trouble. These are difficult, difficult days. Some may be in our room here not much time to think about the political situation, the nation's troubles, because they're so troubled in their own souls. It's hard to see anything much beyond that in the heat of battle when the musket balls are racing through the air and the cannons are blasting and the bayonets are fixed. And we feel as if we have no resources. Help us to see beyond our struggles to the greatness of our God who is a safe place, who gives rest in our restlessness, peace in our war, joy in our sorrow hope in our loneliness and Lord here among us no doubt are those who say Lord I know you're my refuge please let me experience that let it be worked out in this present trial that I'm in let it be worked out in this national calamity that we see Lord, remember mercy as you judge our land. Remember mercy. Remember your people. Come to our aid. O oh, refuge, be our refuge. In Christ's name, amen.